You know, this morning I'm excited to be in God's house as we celebrate um, what Christmas is about. And, you know, as I look around the room, and I noticed it in the first service as well, um, what's so encouraging is I see God moving in you. And what I mean by that is there, there's been a lot of sick people in our church family. There's been a lot of sick people, sick people in our community. But I'm beginning to see God heal and people return back to the fellowship and people return back um, to being with people. And so we are so thankful. Um, if you're here this morning, you, you've been away for a while for whether it be quarantine or whether it be sickness, we are so glad you are back. And I want you to be encouraged because you have a church family who has been on our face begging God to move in your life and begging God to heal you. And so I know there's still some at home today that are, that are still quarantined or still uh, struggling with a sickness, but I want you to be encouraged this morning that God is gonna meet you in your home this morning as well as he's meeting us here. Um, so I'm gonna start out this morning um, as we get ready to, to open God's word. To, I, I'm probably gonna age myself, okay? Some of you are not gonna have any clue at the location I'm talking about. You're not gonna have any clue as to the person I'm talking about, but just entertain me. You will hear the, hear the older ones that will be able to relate. But how many of you have ever seen somebody famous? Not, not at a concert, not at a, a sporting event, but how many of you have ever seen someone that's famous in public? Like they just look like they don't belong, right? You walk by them and it takes you a moment to process who in the world was that? You know, in most cases, they look nothing like you thought they should look. Well, I don't even remember the years. That'll tell you how old I am. But I remember back in the day, some of you will know where I'm talking about. I was at, around Christmas time, at Gwinnett Place Mall. There's about six old people in this one. First service, everybody knew what I was talking about. I was at Gwinnett Place Mall. This was long before the Mall of Georgia. Gwinnett Place Mall was the happening place. That's where you went. And at Christmas time, it was busy. It was just what it was. And I remember being in a specific department store and I walked by a guy. And in that moment, this guy caught my attention and I walked past him. And as I continued to walk, I was thinking, who in the world was that guy? So then I turned into a creeper, right? So then you have to follow the dude around the entire store trying to, just so I can get another frontal view of him. And then I realized in that moment who it was. And I loved basketball, but it was Mark Price. Nobody <laughs> knows Mark Price. <laughs> First service, uh oh. First service, I had a lot of people who knew Mark Price. So y'all are a lot younger than the Mark Price era. But Mark Price was a very, very good basketball player for a school that I didn't even like, truthfully. It was Georgia Tech, you know. But man, he could shoot. Tech was terrible at the time. But Mark Price, John Sally, that whole crew kind of put Georgia Tech on the map for basketball. But what was so ironic or just so interesting about it is when I saw Mark Price, this is an NBA at the time, he was playing for the Cleveland Cavaliers. I looked and I thought, this guy looks nothing like I thought he should look. He was with his wife, he was with his kids, and I was sitting there going, man, this is just an everyday man. He looks just like me. What in the world? And, and here, was the, here was the comical part of it. He wasn't very tall. So you see, I had aspirations of being an NBA basketball player. So when I saw Mark Price that day, it gave me hope. I thought, man, you know what? There's a chance. There is a chance, but obviously there was no chance because I'm here with you and I don't make any kind of money that they make. But, but what was so interesting about Mark Price is he didn't look anything like I thought a professional athlete should look like. Well, you know, that is the very reason that so many people all through the scriptures questioned the Messiah because Jesus didn't appear. He didn't arrive the way that they thought the Messiah, that the savior of the world should arrive. But interesting enough, his arrival actually plays into the character of who God is. His arrival actually plays into helping us better understand how God operates. And so this today, we're gonna to be looking where we've been looking for the last couple of weeks. I want you to flip to Isaiah chapter nine. We're gonna be looking at Isaiah chapter nine and we're just gonna be looking at verse six and we're gonna flip around a couple of different places. But as we've been talking the last two weeks, we've been looking at the name Emmanuel, God with us. 
And today what we're gonna do is unpack some more promises that come with that name, Emmanuel, that God is with us. And when we look at these names, when we look at the, the character of God, my prayer is, is that you leave here today with hope, not just hope for today, but hope for eternity, because that's what Christmas is all about. It's not about the here and the now, but it's about what we've got to look forward to as the church. So I want you to look in verse six of chapter nine. We read a, a verse that we've all heard. It says, for a child will be born to us. A son will be given to us. And the government will rest on his shoulders. And his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. Now, when we look at the very beginning of verse six, we see a prime example of what I just mentioned a moment ago about it not appearing the way that we think it should appear. And when we hear of a child being given, a baby being given, and the government will rest upon his shoulders, that doesn't make a lot of sense to you and I because I have a five-year-old, and if the government was resting on her shoulders, life would be a lot more fun for us all, but it wouldn't be a very stable government. And so when we read that, it's already, it, keeps, it catches us off guard. Wait a minute, a child is gonna be given, a baby will be born and the government will rest on this child's shoulder. But when we look into that, what we understand is what some scholars call this is a two-pronged promise. When we hear of the baby being mentioned, when we hear of the birth of Jesus being mentioned, this was to give hope to the nation of Israel. This was to give hope to the Israelites that hope is coming. Emmanuel, God is coming to be with you. But then when we look at the fact that the government will rest upon his shoulders, this is the other promise for you and I to be looking for the second coming of the Messiah. That the second coming of this same baby, he's gonna look a lot different. He's gonna come in a different fashion but we see here that this is a two-pronged promise. It was for Israel, but it was also for you and I. And so when we look at that, we know that this is bringing hope to them. But when we leave here today, my prayer is, is that the fact that he is coming again and the government is gonna rest on his shoulders will give hope to you and I. And so what we see is, look in verse one. I love how it says this in chapter nine, verse one. But there will be no more gloom. I don't know about you, but I am ready for no more gloom because it seems like every time we turn around, it is more gloom, it is more frustration, it is more depression, it is more anxiety because nobody knows which way to turn. But when we see that, that is a promise if you keep reading that there is no more gloom. Yes, there's no more gloom for the Jews, but it's also introducing the fact that there will be no more gloom for the Gentiles, who is you and I, meaning that Christ is for all that the coming Messiah is for, yes, the children of Israel, but he is also going to be for all who will believe and all who will trust in him as savior. And so when we see this, we see that there will be no more gloom because of this Messiah. Now, what we're really gonna focus on this morning, I had absolutely no intentions of even talking about it because we can read about the baby, we can read about um, the child being born, but the fact that it says the government will rest on his shoulders. Truthfully, never did I think I would be talking about or mentioning the government at Christmas. But man, how timely of God's word. Because right now, let's just be honest, the government is a reason for a lot of confusion, a lot of chaos, a lot of conflict. But can I tell you, there's coming a day that our government's gonna look a lot different. There's coming a day that our government is going to be turned upside down because we read about the destiny of this baby Jesus. There's coming a Messiah and the government will rest on his shoulders. And when he returns, when baby Jesus comes back, He's not gonna return the way that he first came. He's gonna return as a supreme warrior and he will exercise his rule and his authority over all the nations, over all the kingdoms and over all the world. 
He will be the authority. And I love how it says that the government will rest on its shoulders. What we see here, when we talk about shoulders, we already see the parallel of the good shepherd. Because if you know anything about the shepherd, the shepherd was responsible for watching over the sheep. And when a sheep wandered off, the shepherd would go and pursue the sheep that was lost. And in most cases, we know that he would place the sheep on his shoulders and return them back to the flock where they belong. Church, this is our hope that there's coming a Messiah and he's going to place us as his children on his shoulders. This is where we find peace. This is where we find the courage. This is where we find the endurance to keep moving forward as the church because we're gonna be resting on his shoulders. Now, I wasn't even gonna ask this question, but I'm gonna ask it. How many of you are absolutely sick and tired and disgusted of political commercials? Praise God, we all are. I've got my kids walking around the house quoting commercials about politicians. And I scream, you know, what every loving father says, shut up, I hear it enough. We're watching the Grinch the other night. Me and Deacon are curled up on the couch and here it comes again. But when we look at these political commercials, what we understand and what we see is we are seeing billions of dollars being advertised to promote imperfect people. And they're promoting imperfect people as if they are going to be the perfect solution. Can I tell you, it does not matter what party you stand with, but they are imperfect people and their solution will not be perfect. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter where you stand. But the reality is, is we are pumping billions of dollars into this. And all we're doing is watching imperfect people tear down other imperfect people to promote their own agenda. And can I tell you, it doesn't matter how you voted, it doesn't matter where you stand, you're gonna be let down by the one you voted for. Every single one of us. But there's coming a day when the Messiah will rule over all And can I tell you, in him, there is no disappointment. In him, there is no conflict. In him, there is no confusion. In him, there is no chaos because of who he is. And we're gonna unpack who he is. And we're gonna unpack today in these four to five names why he is qualified for the government to rest on his shoulders. Now, you notice I said four to five names. The reason that I say four to five names is because the way we read it, some of your versions of the Bible, it may have a comma between the word wonderful and counselor. Mine puts them together. So we see those four names, wonderful counselor, mighty God, eternal or everlasting father, prince of peace. These four names is basically the campaign for our savior. This is why he will qualify to carry the weight of all the world on his shoulders. So so that we can better get a picture and better understand, we are going to separate the word wonderful and counselor. Because that word wonderful is a word that in our culture and in our society, we use it a lot. Some of you have gone and seen Christmas lights over the last couple of weeks and you've came home. How were the Christmas lights? Oh, they were wonderful. How was your Christmas meal? Oh, it was wonderful. How was this? How, oh, it was wonderful. Because in our vocabulary, the word wonderful simply means pleasant or it's lovely, somewhat likable. It literally said that in one definition, somewhat likable. And I was like, well, that's not too wonderful. Somewhat likable. But when we throw that word around, it comes ha- just sort of haphazard. Food was wonderful. Our spouse is wonderful, and I do mean that. She's shaking her head and getting red now. She gets really red when I point at her and talk about her. Are you really red now? She's saying, stop. (laughs) But the word wonderful in this context, when we look at it, 
Our English language cannot translate the word wonderful as to what the writer is wanting us to see and hear. Because the word wonderful in this context means this, incomprehensible. It means that is full of wonder. It means that it is mind boggling. It says that mind boggling. And to you and I, what that means is it doesn't make sense. So the word wonderful makes no sense. We can't comprehend what it means because we can't put a definition on it. And so when we talk about wonderful, we understand that it just boggles our mind. We see an example of it in Judges. We see that, a, that an angel of the Lord appears to a man named Manoah and Manoah asks the angel, what is your name? And the angel responds by saying, why are you asking? You see that it's wonderful. Why are you asking my name? Because you wouldn't understand it anyway. Because it's mind boggling what the word wonderful means. But I think we all know, know and understand that Jesus has always performed in a mind boggling way. Jesus has always done things to you and I that make absolutely no sense. Some of those things is the way he was born. He was conceived in a virgin. Do we need to talk about that one? To you and I, that doesn't make a lot of sense. When we see it again, we see that a, this is a man who would take mud or dirt spit in it, create mud, and rub it in a blind guy's eyes so that he can see. Have you ever had mud in your eyes? It's the last thing I can do is see. It hurts, there's grit, it's scratching, your eyes are watering, you're miserable. But Jesus, being wonderful, does things that don't make sense to you and I. We see that he lived a sinless life. And I know we throw that around, but what we fail to, to understand a lot is that Jesus faced the very same temptations. He faced the same struggles that you and I face, yet he never caved. That makes no sense. How in the world did he do it? It's mind boggling. This is the same man that could speak over a dead body and the dead body be brought back to life. There's no science that can define that. There's no science that can help us better understand how that happened because science can't define God. This is the same man who himself was crucified, was dead for three days, and he walked out of the tomb. That makes no sense because the Messiah is wonderful. I am thankful that I serve a God that I can't explain. I am thankful that I serve a God who does things that make absolutely no sense. And so then when we attach this word wonderful with this word counselor, you see counselor is very similar even in the context that they're talking about here that a counselor is someone that gives direction or, or someone that gives advice. So you and I have access to the Holy Spirit, to God, that we can receive counsel. We can receive wonderful counsel. We can receive the direction. And what I, I read it in Colossians that, that Jesus has the treasure of God's wisdom. That Jesus is the treasure of God's wisdom. I don't know about you, but when I'm seeking direction, I don't want the wisdom of this world. I don't want the direction or the, the wisdom of, of some political party. What I want direction from is an almighty God who is the treasure of God's wisdom. That's the direction that I want as a father. That's the direction that I want as a husband because it is the truth. Jesus says that he is the truth. And I think we are in a season of life where the truth is refreshing. Did you know there's coming a day that our government will lie on the shoulders of truth? 
There's coming a day when our government will operate not outside of truth, but it will operate on the truth because he is the truth. The government will rest on the truth. And this is what makes him the wonderful counselor because it is truth. Because you see, we're hearing lies on all sides. And we see what happens when we're hearing all the lies from all the sides is it's doing nothing but create confusion in our world. It's creating confusion in all of our homes and all of our lives and all of our communities. But the truth, Jesus is the one that will bring clarity. He makes the direction clear. Now, you're about to see how I'm wired because this, what I'm about to share next has absolutely nothing to do with kind of the direction we're talking, but I'm gonna share it anyway something that I want to prepare you for. As you seek direction from the Lord on how to lead your home, how to lead your family, how to, how to lead your finances, all of the ways that you seek wisdom, understand that if we're approaching a wonderful counselor, keep in mind that this wonderful means that it doesn't make sense, that it's mind boggling, that it's hard to understand. So when we accompany that word wonderful with this counselor that's gonna give you direction, that's gonna give you the path in which you should go, there's gonna be a lot of times that the direction that God calls you will not make sense to the human mind. It will not make sense on paper. So as you lead your home, can I tell you that this wonderful counselor is gonna give you the direction on how to lead your home and I can promise you the world is not gonna agree with it. It's not gonna make sense to the world. It's not gonna make sense to the lost. But in that moment, when we surrender to the walk of the wonderful counselor, when we go against the grain, when we surrender to his direction, this is what gives him the ability to prove what his next name is. And that is mighty God. That gives him the ability to show that he is mighty God. Because him being mighty God, even in the season of chaos and confusion that we are in, there's coming a day when he returns that the chaos comes to a halt because he is mighty God. And all of this confusion, all of this chaos that we are experiencing, I want you to understand that this is not of the Lord. We read about it in 1 Corinthians that he says that God is not the author of confusion. So if we're confused about something, can I tell you God is not of it? God is not the author of confusion. Matter of fact, he's actually the opposite of confusion. He is the one that calms the storms. He is the one that stops the winds. He is the one that parts the water. So in the midst of the chaos, he is the settler. He is the one that stops it all. He controls all of the chaos. And we read about this prophetic name being fulfilled of mighty God. We read about it in the book of Revelation and how he is going to bring control to the chaos. I want you to flip to the book of Revelation. When I mentioned Revelation first service, it was like a, ooh, everybody was just like, we're gonna go to the Revelation. So flip to Revelation chapter 12. We're gonna look in a couple of different places here. In Revelation chapter 12, verse five, we see of how a mighty God is going to bring control to a chaos when he returns. And she gave birth to a son, a male child, who is to rule all of the nations with a rod of iron. And her child was called up to God to his throne. 
There's coming a day when this baby Jesus is going to rule this world, going to rule this universe with what the scripture says, the iron rod. Flip over to chapter 19. Chapter 19, verse 15. You're gonna hear the same language here again. It says, from his mouth comes a sharp sword. Now, this is the second coming of Christ. He's gonna look a lot different than little baby Jesus. I don't care how you got him, if he's eight pounds, if he's four pounds, whatever. But look at the second coming of Christ in verse 15. He says, from his mouth comes a sharp sword. And so that with it, he may strike down the nations. He will rule them with a rod of iron. And he treads the winepress of the fierce wrath of God, the almighty. Now look, verse 16 is one that ought to bring the church to its feet because it says, and on his robe and on his thigh, he has the name written King of Kings and Lord of Lords. When he comes back, he's coming back as King. He's coming back as Lord. And guess what? My King, my Lord controls the chaos. He settles this storm that we are in. And as if that is not good enough, if that's not enough good news, chapter two, verse five of of Revelation, we read again from the mouth of Jesus or verse 25, I'm sorry. But we read what Jesus says here. He says, nevertheless, what you have hold fast until I come. He doesn't say that there's a chance he might come. There's not a slim possibility, but he says, you hold fast until I come. And he who overcomes and he who keeps my deeds until the end, to him I will give authority over the nations and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. Do you understand what Jesus is speaking of here? Not only is he coming back as king of kings and Lord of lords to rule all of the earth with this rod of iron, but church, that is the team that we are on. And guess what? We will rule in authority with him. That is good news and y'all aren't getting it. Y'all need to pray (laughs) because we win. The chaos is controlled. The confusion will be over because all the nations will be under his authority. And guess what? He doesn't have to get elected. It doesn't matter how you vote. It doesn't matter how I vote because he will be the authority because he is mighty God. We fall under his authority and the word says that every knee shall bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. So whether you believe or not, you're going to. But the question is, will it be too late or not? The Father's bringing control to the chaos, which leads us to the last, or not the last name, but the next name, Everlasting Father. Now, I know as a child, there was one voice in the home that could control chaos, and that was Daddy. When Daddy spoke up, everybody listened. And sometimes Daddy's voice is strong enough, he ain't even gotta open his mouth, he just looks and it controls the chaos. But that is what leads us to this everlasting father, that when the father speaks, when the father returns, everything changes. Everything changes. Now look, I'm sensitive to this often because when we talk about the word father, there's some of you even in this room right now that when you hear father, when you, when you hear daddy, that could be pretty complex because we don't wanna have to, a lot of times what keeps people from trusting in this heavenly father is because of our worldly and tainted view of an earthly father. Because sometimes with an earthly father, you've been let down. Sometimes with an earthly father, you've been brokenhearted. And so when you hear the word father, that's a very complex name because maybe your life has been full of ups and downs because of an earthly father. Very similar to our government. 
There's a lot of ups and downs. There's a lot of complexity to our government. Some things we like, some things we don't like, some, things, some way they satisfy, some ways they don't. And so it's just an emotional roller coaster. And maybe that was your life with your earthly father. And so because of your earthly father being absent, because of your earthly father letting you down, it is hard for you to envision that there is an eternal father, that there is an everlasting father who again, remember, is not like an earthly father. Because if you remember the very first name we talked about, wonderful. So the fact that a father can love you, the fact that a father can provide for you, the fact that a father can protect you may be mind-blowing and hard for you to understand, but always keep in mind that he is the wonderful, everlasting father. He is the wonderful, eternal father. There will be no complexity when he comes back for his children. He will not let you down. He will be your provider. He will be your protector because of who his name says he is. And so when Christ comes as the everlasting father, there's no complexity to it. It'll be very simple to recognize. It'll be very simple to see, to trust, to believe. And it's gonna be for eternity. And so when we look, we see that the writer of Hebrews says that your years will never come to an end because this everlasting father is the alpha. He's the omega. He's the first and the last. He's the beginning and the end. He will never disappoint. There's no complexity to his authority. There's no complexity to who he is. There will be no Senate. There'll be no house. There'll be no president. There'll be no vice president because he is the king of kings and the Lord of lords. And that is all that matters. And guess what? His term is not for four years, but it's forever. It's forever. And this is where we find hope. This is where we find peace. This is where we have to understand that under his authority, under his ability to be our eternal everlasting father is where we will find eternal peace because he will always provide, he'll always protect because he is this very last name. He's the prince of peace. He's the prince of peace. You know, Prince of Peace is not very hard to to define the way I define it because we've been talking about the conflict. We've been talking about the confusion and we know that is one side against another. That is multiple sides against multiple things and, and everybody's just bickering. Everybody's at each other's throat. But you see, the opposite of peace is none of that. The opposite or the, the opposite of conflict is peace. And with peace, there is absolutely no conflict. And to you and I, especially when we look around us, that's mind boggling. That doesn't make sense because we think there's no way that we will ever achieve that. There's no way we will ever arrive there. Yeah, we will. Because he's coming again. He's coming again. And we trust in this promise of the Messiah. So I know that we've been talking a lot about, I know this may seem kind of outside the box because we talk about the baby Jesus being born, but here we are, we're looking at his destiny. We're looking at him to come back again. We're kind of not talking about the birth, but what we had to understand, it all had to start with the birth for him to come again. And so you're maybe thinking, well, Brian, is that my only hope is that when he comes again, can I only have peace when he comes again? Will I only have peace when he returns? Is that the only way that we as the church can experience peace right now in this mess that we're living in? No, because you remember again what the first word was, wonderful. We serve a God who can give peace now. We serve a God who can meet us right where we're at. We serve a God who can give us the peace to put our head on our pillow at night, knowing that we are a child of the King and in the end we win. 
because he is wonderful. He's mind boggling. The way he works doesn't make sense to us. And so no, we don't have to wait to the second coming to have peace. We don't have to wait to that because he's wonderful because he can meet you right where you're at. He can give you peace now. But you've got to lay all of your weight down. You've got to quit trying to make sense of it all and just surrender to the fact that you serve a God who you will never understand. But in his kingdom, when he is the authority over all of the world, there will be no confusion, there'll be no, no chaos, there'll be no complexity, and there'll be no conflict because the weight of the government will rest on little baby Jesus' shoulders. Doesn't make a lot of sense, does it? It's because he's wonderful. It's because he's mighty God. It's because he's everlasting father. And it's because he's the prince of peace. So the way that you have trust or the way that you have peace today is you've got to trust him today. Now, just to be as transparent as I know how, the last two weeks in our community, the last two to three weeks in our church family and in our schools, in your child's life and in my child's life have probably been some of the most difficult weeks of our life. Because there's so much confusion, there's so much chaos. And I always go and I, I study on Tuesdays. And I'll just be honest, because of the last two, three weeks being so difficult, you know how much I wanted to study on Tuesday? Not a whole lot. I was discouraged. I was frustrated. Because ultimately, we just want to be obedient to the Lord. And, and with everything coming at you from every angle, you don't know which way to turn. And so I had to really get honest before the Lord and say, God, right now I'm having a hard time believing that you're wonderful. That you're a wonderful counselor because I'm seeking your direction. And it's like every time I think I hear your voice, all of a sudden that direction changes again. So God, I'm having a hard time trusting you as wonderful counselor God, if you were mighty, why didn't all this chaos stop? If you're an everlasting father, God, right now to me, it appears you're letting me down because you're not answering the prayers that I want answered. You're not performing in the way that I think you should perform. And because you're not doing what I want you to do, there's not a lot of peace. But then it all went back to that word, wonderful. And when I surrender to the idea that God is gonna do things that don't make sense to me, that God is gonna do things that are mind boggling, that God is gonna do things that don't line up on paper, what I gotta understand is what he's doing is he's setting the stage to prove he is mighty God. And my job as a follower of Christ is to trust the truth. To trust the truth. But you know, in the midst of even trying to find out directions and answers, Y'all do realize that even 
for this pastor, for, for our team here, we got families that we've got to continue to try to figure out. And so then you throw difficulties of your family into the mix of all that. And you lose loved ones. It is very, very hard to find peace a lot of times. But I just gotta remember, you've gotta remember, he's wonderful. He's the wonderful counselor. He is mighty God. He is the everlasting father and he is our prince of peace. But here's another reason the Christian faith makes no sense. You know how you find that peace? You surrender. The world will tell you to fight for it. The world will tell you to Stay strong, stay bold. But do you know how you do that as a follower of Jesus Christ? You surrender. The way we win is we surrender because remember, we're surrendering to a mighty God. We're surrendering to a one that overcomes death. We're surrendering to a one that can heal anything. Because here's a newsflash. You do know that mighty God could speak right now in this moment and say, you're healed. And you know that COVID-19 would bow. That's the God I serve. And yeah, I wish that was the case. But as a follower of Christ, what we as the church have got to do in the meantime We've got to surrender. We have to wave the white flag and let him fight for us. And I know the prideful side of a man, that's hard to do. I got this. I don't need that. That's weak. That's weak. You know what? Call me weak because I serve a God who's mighty. And that's the only way we win. And so this morning, I know that there's people in this room that have been right where I've been for the last two weeks. You've already been ready to throw in the towel. You look at your children and it breaks your heart because Christmas doesn't appear the same for them as it does you it was for your childhood that's hard it's hard that this Christmas season that you're not going to get to hug necks of people that you want to hug necks with and maybe you feel like just quitting maybe you feel like surrendering and just saying God I give up can I tell you you're in the right place That's why the Christian faith is wonderful. Because the way we win is we surrender. We trust to what we can't see. We gotta believe that God's doing something. God's working, God's moving. But we've just gotta surrender to that. So I wonder if you would be obedient enough this morning to come to this altar and surrender. Maybe it's your family. Maybe COVID has hit home. Maybe you've lost loved ones and maybe you're mad at God. I beg you, get on your knees and tell him you're mad at him. He's pretty big. He can handle it. He wants us to be honest. But maybe you're here this morning and you've never placed your faith in him. You've never trusted him as Lord.
Can I tell you, that's where your peace is going to come from. So I want you to stand to your feet this morning and I want you to be obedient. If you're worn out, if you're discouraged, surrender. Surrender. God, I thank you for being here with us. I thank you that Emmanuel hasn't changed. God, I know there's people in this room that need to tangibly feel your presence. God, I pray that you would do something that blows all of our minds and that they would physically feel you wrap your loving arms around them right now in this moment and tell them you love them. But God, I pray that right now that our pride would die. And Lord, I pray that we would surrender to the wonderful counselor, to the mighty God, to the everlasting Father, so that we can have peace in the Prince. God, have your way in this room in Jesus' name, amen.